Right, hello everybody and welcome to the Law Careers Net Live London partner panel. My name is Neve Gray, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a content and engagement coordinator for Law Careers Net. Today we will be discussing law firms as businesses, and to do that I am joined by Vic from Bristow's, I have Charlotte from RPC, I have Chris from Cooley, and I have Alison from Osborne Clark. I will let all of them introduce themselves properly in just a second, but first of all, I'm going to just talk about exactly what it is that we're going to be discussing today. So, we're going to talk about how law firms actually function as businesses, so things like their costs and winning business. We're going to be talking about what makes a good commercial lawyer, which hopefully will be helpful to all of you. And we're going to be talking about what the future looks like for trainees today. So, I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves. So, Vic, starting with you. Sure, thanks, Neve. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vic Karana. I'm a partner at Bristow's. Uh, we're a UK firm, mainly focused on the technology and life sciences sectors. Uh, I'm a commercial technology lawyer, which essentially means I work with technology companies as they grow and they launch new products and services in the market, helping them with data protection advice, IP advice, contracting, licensing. And then because technology basically affects every company and every industry and every organization, I work a lot with clients in banking and financial services and energy and public sector and any kind of sector who are using technology in different ways. And at the moment, that's all about artificial intelligence. Thank you. Charlotte? Great, thanks. Uh, I'm Charlotte Henschen. I'm a partner at RPC, which is a full-service international commercial firm. I'm in the commercial and banking disputes team, which means I work in high court litigation and the appellate courts dealing with disputes between businesses. I quite often act for asset managers, fund managers, financial institutions, corporates and high net worths in claims against the investment banks, which can be a fun place to be. Um, I've been at the firm since 2015, prior to which I was at Ashurst for six years where I trained and qualified and have spent some time in Asia uh, and since all in London. Thank you. Chris? So my name is Chris Stack. I'm a partner at Cooley. Um, I'm a partner in the employment team, which means I do all things employment related. So that's anything from uh, working on the employment related elements of transactions, so buying and selling companies, um, employment litigation, always the bad guy, always defending the litigation, um, business protection, so a little bit of stuff in the high court when people do naughty things like steal confidential information and clients want to uh, protect that, and then anything in the advisory space, so any weird and wonderful things that clients might like uh, help with. So that could be, at the moment, sadly, lots of redundancies, or it could be contracts, policies, and the like. Um, I trained at Osborne Clark. Um, uh, which is where Alison is, uh, and I joined Cooley in 2015, which is when Cooley launched um, in London. I also spent three years of my career um, based on the west coast of, of the States, actually first time with Osborne Clark and second time with, uh, with Cooley. Thank you, and Alison. Chris has basically introduced me. Um, I'm Alison, I'm a partner at Osborne Clark. I sit in the funds team um, and I do fund formation work and corporate work pretty much all within the built environment sector. Um, I, funnily enough, also moved in 2015, which was the same year as these two, so it must have been a, a, a key, key, um, key year for moving. But I trained at what was then BLP, now BCLP. I was there for a few years and then, um, and then made the move across. Um, I've been a part of, partner for nearly five years, um, and I'm, as well as my client work, I am very involved with the built environment sector. I'm, I'm part of the leadership group there, um, which I'm happy to talk about later. Um, I'm also part of the um, trainee leadership group, um, so looking at graduate recruitment, which I'm sure you'll be very interested in. Um, we also do a lot around our apprentices as well, which is super exciting and a great new way into law. Um, and then obviously looking after the trainees and apprentices once they've actually joined us. Brilliant, thank you. We're definitely going to come on to some of that a bit later. Uh, Alison, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. So my first question is, what's the fundamental thing that everybody needs to understand about law firms operating as businesses? Right. <laughs> one to start. Starting small then. Um, I guess the, the most important thing about a law firm is we, we are a people business. The people in the business are the service what, that we can provide. So looking after our people, hiring the right people, retaining the right people is, is the fundamental thing because what we offer our clients is our time. Um, so, so these sorts of events are super, super important to our business. It's a bit like us going round, if we were a, a you know, 
high street shop going around to you know go and look at kind of fairs where we where we pickle our stock it's it's really important that we hire the right people so we are people business so our people but also our clients are people and that kind of that relationship with them on a human level is so so important um, and ultimately what makes a business work that you actually make some money out of it and um, and we should make no secret of that you know we are here to make you know a, to have a profitable business which means we need to make sure we're looking at the right areas of law the right clients we can keep under constant review whether those clients remain profitable for us um, and so that is that is really important to know so from a very early start in your career understanding how the billable hour works how how we make profit out of clients, why it's important to record your time, why it's important to, to put your bills in is fundamentally important. And we try and give training on that at a really early stage because I think it really helps you. It's, in, it's, it's ridiculous to just start that when you're a partner. You cannot do that. You've got to understand it right from the outset, you know, from PA right through to the most senior partner. Thank you, and I'm glad you brought in money because the next section is law firm economics. So good place to start. Um, Vic, how do firms or teams within firms even find new business? How do you go out and look for clients to bring in that money? Oh gosh, if I knew the exact <laughs> thing that worked, then I don't know, I'd probably be a wealthier person. But so, I mean, look, I think firms do try a myriad of things to make that work. I mean, ultimately, I think a lot of firms have long standing clients who trust them over the long term, are able to help them in lots of different sort of ways. In that way, I think growth for an existing client is a key aspect of that. So, you know, I don't, different firms have different approaches, but sometimes if you're working on a case or transaction with a client, there's sometimes opportunities to talk to them about other practice areas, business groups within the firm, and try and help cross sell. And it's sometimes seen as a bit of a dirty word, but actually if it's done right, it can be done in a win-win way with the client benefits too, and you deepen and strengthen the relationship. That then means we ultimately make more money, but we've just got a stronger relationship with that client. And then there's the other side, you know, targeting new and emerging clients. And in somewhere like the tech sector, that's somewhere that's, you know, there's lots of emerging businesses arising. And then from there, it's about a mix of things, what we, I guess you'd class as traditional business development. So there's profile raising you do through articles and speaking events uh, to sort of talk about new areas of law and practice and trends, trying to get in front of the right people. And that, you know, it, I don't think people should think of it as a linear line, as if I do this event, I'm going to get that new client. Uh, sometimes those things come through weird and wonderful ways. And actually, I think as firms, I think a lot of firms and probably everyone represented on this panel, their firms probably do um, really adopt new kind of communication channels around this, whether that's blogs and podcasts and social media and trying to make sure that we're speaking to the right people in the right way and having something, something good to say. That can be a way where generally there's this rising tide where the firm's profile or a team or an individual's profile raises so that you end up just somehow attracting work, not exactly always knowing exactly how that comes about. Thank you. So it sounds like being personal, making sure that you have a good relationship with your clients so that they recommend you both to other um, departments in their firm but also other yeah. people is quite key. Um, my next question is, what are law firms' biggest costs, Chris? I'm going to come to you for this yeah. one. Not surprising. There are two really big costs. Uh, the biggest one, people. Um, uh, salaries, costs of employing people. Like We're in a people business. It's a relationship business. As Alison was saying, in law firms, that basically the commodity we sell really is like people in a way and our, and our knowledge and our ability to distill that knowledge in a way that clients uh, want, to, want to receive it. Uh, and the other big one is property. Like law firms do have these nice shiny new offices uh, in all sorts of weird and wonderful and expensive cities around the world, uh, and that is expensive. Um, we also spend an awful lot of money on tech, um, uh, and that is um, probably an increasing portion of our spend. Right? Like lots of our clients at Cooley are they are tech first clients. They're very tech forward, and so we have to be able to um, sing from the same hymn sheet. And so we spend an awful lot of money um, on that as well. So. You know, when you, when you look at the way that law firms spend their money, I think they're probably the three, three biggest costs that we have. Thank you, and we're definitely going to be coming on to tech and especially AI, because I know that's a keen interest for a lot of people here. Um, my last one on law firm economics is, Charlotte, I wanted to come on to you. Do you think that the costs have changed a lot for law firms recently with the cost of living? So changes to salaries, what clients are expecting to pay, things like that? 
Yes, <laughs> but I think it's also worth noting they've all, they're always in a constant state of flux anyway. I think over the last 12 to 18 months, there have probably been greater headwinds uh, in terms of salary expectations because of the cost of living of the staff, um, and that includes legal business services and across the firm, and at the same time, a pressure from clients that they, there is an ever-increasing demand for efficiency and cost transparency. So looking at innovative ways that we can bill, not just time spent, I think is coming more to the fore that clients might prefer um, a predictable amount and say, I want to know what I'm going to be spending for the next six months on this, rather than fluctuating invoices one month to the next. And of course, they have got their own demands on cost and expenses. So it's not unheard, it's not new as such, but I think um, we're expecting, our clients are expecting us constantly to be better and improving on how we manage costs for them and i think that leads us on quite next quite nicely to the next part which is the evolution of firms so how firms are changing and adapting so my first question is for chris and it's firms are as we've said constantly changing so what are the main drivers that instigate these changes um well look, we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about ai separately but i mean that that has been a huge shift in the way that everyone is thinking about law and the future of law I had a client the other day um, who isn't the most like, technically a capable client who sent me something that was phenomenally good. Uh, and I, I sort of asked the question, like, where did you get that from? And, and, and the client said, I, I used um, ChatGPT to generate it. Um, uh, so like, that, that is, that is going to be a change. That's going to be an evolution. Um, we're also, and it makes me sound like an old man, I feel like an old man saying this, but there's, there's a new generation coming into, into law firms now. And uh, the, the younger lawyers that we have and we work with um, have different career aspirations and different ways in which they want to work. Post-COVID, certainly at Cooley, we, we sort of, you know, we're not in the office all the time anymore, and that's been a big, um, that's been a big change. Um, there is a much bigger focus and an ever-growing focus on the really important issues of like diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, and I think that's been a big, big shift, and it's got a lot more focus from law firms who, um, I think, no longer pay lip service to it, but really, really believe it and, and, and are engaged um, with it. And so you get this real like, melting pot of all sorts of changes, technological, um, societal changes, all coming together together and, and you, you really feel that impact in law firms and like at Cooley we spend a lot of time thinking about that and thinking about how we can evolve and change to sort of deliver both the best service to our clients and also provide the best opportunities for our, our lawyers. Brilliant, thank you. And I do actually want to go on to diversity a bit more. So Charlotte, you mentioned in our prep call that you do a lot of like mentoring to lawyers who come back from maternity leave. So I wondered if you could speak a bit about being a woman in law and what that experience is yeah. like. And it's really interesting, you know, hearing Rona talk about her experience, I, I joined the legal profession about 15 years ago now, and it has changed enormously even in that time. And I was at an event recently where um, one of the Lady Justices was giving a speech about her experience in the bar in the 80s, and it is a world different. You know, some of the comments that she said she had to tolerate, essentially, would I can't imagine a room in which they would be said now, thankfully. But as Chris has said, I think the conversation has moved on from it's now not just about diversity of having different, it's about people feeling genuinely included, a sense of belonging and acceptance that difference is good and not just something that we should strive for, for a quota or for statistical benefit. Um, I think it's also something that we can benefit from other industries. So I'm also involved in a cross-industry mentoring for women, which is fascinating because I'm actually mentoring an engineer at the moment about her experience, and it's a completely different, very male-dominated sector. And I think there's much that we can learn across, and so much of it is just about network, and the more that we know people and can share experiences and help others come through, all power to it. Thank you, and Alison, I know that gender diversity in law is quite a broad topic, but do you have anything else that you'd like to add to that? I mean, Charlotte's covered a lot. I think it's just, it's so important. People aren't afraid to talk about it now, and that's, that's great. I mean, I've seen, you know, I've worked in this industry for, for a long time, and I have seen a huge amount of change, huge amount of change in what leadership of law firms looks like, um, which is great. It's not there yet. We are not, you know, most... Most partnerships, I think, are still stuck at about 75, 25 men to women, which is not good enough. Um, and, and I hope you guys are going to change that because I hope that, you know, the law firms of the future don't look like that because, um, because that's not what society looks like. Um, but there has been a lot of change. There's a lot more to come. Um, but I think it's not a taboo subject anymore, and that's 
great and people are certainly at OC people are really willing to call things out when they're not right I certainly will would and even things like 10 years ago I bet this panel could easily have been for white men um, that will not happen now and we would not put someone on a panel that that was the panel um, you would not host that panel as well I know you wouldn't so um, um, and that's good and you know that change needs to keep we just keep need to keep kind of um, keep doing that brilliant thank you um, Vic, you are, I believe, the race leader of the Race and Ethnicity Group at Bristow's, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we've got, um, I mean, we've got an approach to it where we've got an inclusion group and there's lots of strands and subgroups there and they cover lots of things. So gender and um, LGBT and carers and other networks. And I'm involved with the Race and Cultural and Ethnicity Group called the Lider Network. It's named after a uh, African-American woman in the... 1900s who kind of quite interesting for Bristow's so she invented a type of hairbrush and patented it one of those very few African-American women who held a patent at that time uh, that worked on African Caribbean hair and so we've we've done that we've named it after her but really it covers lots of types of meanings of race and ethnicities and what I mean really our goal there is to spotlight and highlight events and people and give them a platform to talk more. So just this week we had an external speaker speaking about how to speak about race to children. She's an author, written books on that subject. And it's kind of interesting in the Q&A, like people, it just enabled a discussion to happen, to, especially for parents in the room, to just learn some lessons about how to talk to children about uh, what might be perceived as difficult subjects at their different points in time. So it's about a year old and we've done lots of events. Uh, lots of our events focus around food and food from different countries, which is a nice way to bring people in. Um, but yeah, it's going quite well. Brilliant, thank you. I think that's actually a very good film about that woman that yeah, I watched. Is. So yeah, I recommend good. that to everybody. Um, and Chris, you spoke to me briefly in the call about the Diversity Fellowship that Cooley offers. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. I, so we're just following on from something that you said, Vic. It's actually been one of the things I think has really shifted in law firms is having those um, like difficult conversations about difficult topics. I, I, I really noticed that at Cooley. We started uh, having them actually. They probably, a uh, number of them increased during lockdown. Um, and they might have been on topics like, for example, when George Floyd was murdered, we had a, a lot of discussion around that, external speakers coming in to talk about it, and then small group sessions. And what was really interesting about that is when we first started having them, people are worried because they're worried about saying the wrong thing, using the wrong word, and offending someone. And then once it's moved on beyond that, people realise that actually this is a safe space, and if I say the wrong thing, someone will correct me, but in a, in a sort of constructive way. You realise that the workplace becomes a much more open environment because people are happy to have those difficult conversations about topics that... Previously, I think people would have shied away from uh, from having. But to, uh, to your question around diversity fellowship, so um, uh, one of the things that Cooley offers is for people who've shown, and it's a, an application process, but for people who've shown a commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, is uh, a fellowship, which is essentially some some funding and kind of two goes, if you like, at the vacation scheme. So you get to have a, a dry run at it the year before um, and, and an entrance into it for the year that you would normally um, have the vacation scheme. Uh, and also some, um, some, some financial backing with that as well. And th look, th that can be any commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion. So sometimes that will be social mobility. That's a, that's a real issue in, in law firms. Um, we had someone just last week, a, a professor, come and talk to us around the, the sort of the class ceiling that you still see in law firms, which is a, a huge issue. There is still a huge bias in law firms. I'm someone who was at state school the entire way through, but there's a huge bias in law firms towards independent and fee-paying schools still. Um, and so that's part of what Diversity Fellowship is about, is making sure that people might have that additional, that additional opportunity. So it's certainly worthwhile talking to the Coop team here if anyone's interested in that. Thank you, and I do absolutely have to name drop Upreach on that, who we work with, who are champions of social mobility, and I definitely recommend looking at their website, so I'm <laughs> just going to put them in there. Um, I'm going to come to some audience questions before we go on to the next part of the panel, so can we have those up, please? <coughs> going to make sure that I can read can them over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Do you know what? I'm going to walk over here. I feel like this is easier. Yeah. Um... What sustainability initiatives does your firm have? Do I have a volunteer for this one, or I can pick on people? I'm happy to take it. Brilliant, so, Charlotte. Um, as a, so as a firm, I think ESG and sustainability has become, again, much more prominent on the plan agenda about how firm is growing. Having said that, again, 
I don't actually think it's anything particularly new in some ways. It's actually something that firms have always had to have a view to for a long time because clients, again, expect it. A lot of our clients during a pitch process have had interest about um, ESG credentials, carbon footprint, and how we're improving. So what our firm has done is we've developed a strategy that's based on the UN um, Sustainable Growth Plan, and we've selected eight of the particular strategies that are of most application, as we see it, to a firm providing legal services. And I think it's quite interesting that we can, you know, we're hearing from Rona talking about what competition law does. There's actually an intrinsic ESG value of that in terms of regulating markets and, and creating a safe economy. And what Chris said about employment law, although you said you're on the defence side, it's important to have real rigour about the legal processes, about how employment law evolves. So actually, we've invested in education um, globally, access to legal services um, across jurisdictions, and sustainable growth in terms of how we profile and footprint our production and utilisation of services here. Um, and we now have a, a sustainable and responsible business charter that we publish annually, which clients are very interested to read, it turns out. They, have, they really do hold us to account on what we're doing. Brilliant, thank you. Can I just add something? Yeah, please I think do. The interesting thing about, I think that's all super interesting what you're doing. We, you know, we have similar processes. Law firms are in a really interesting position because we have to think of our own sustainability issues because we are a business, but obviously we're also giving advice to clients on their business. So um, part of what we need to do as well is we make sure we're sort of upholding ourselves to the same standards that we're advising our clients on. And what I'm finding really interesting with clients is they not necessarily in a kind of formal legal advice sense, but it often comes up in discussions over lunch or whatever. What are you as a business doing? We're often bigger than a lot of our clients, so they're really interested. What are we doing about sustainability, DNI, recruitment, all sorts of things? And I think that's a really interesting aspect to your role that can be um, something you didn't necessarily think about when you went into law, because but we, you know the, the, the two things aren't totally separate. No, that is really interesting. You become almost a mentor to your clients, yeah, in effect. Yeah, and, and, and vice versa. There are some of our clients who are much further down the sustainability journey. So, um, so we, you know, you have to be careful, you know, be careful you're not trying to teach them something they already know, but also being really honest when you can learn things from them as well. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I think quite an interesting question that we've got here is, is COVID-19 still impacting your firm? So Vic, I'm coming to you with this one. Well, I think you could say it's impacting in the sense that how it changed the world of work. I think Chris touched on that already. But so we've, you know, it's accelerated that the fact there was a pandemic where overnight we were, everyone was forced to work from home and spin up resources and enable people were comfortable to do that. That's accelerated that pace of change around hybrid working that was starting to take off anyway especially for law firms, tend to be a bit behind the curve of the general, general industry on, on kind of flexible working anyway. But I think what it's meant as we've sort of come out of the pandemic is we've tried to then sort of cement practices that then work, that reflects that hybrid working is great and encouraged, but to put kind of principles around it that mean that we don't, we don't lose the important culture that we think we've built as a firm because ultimately that culture is built and maintained by people being together in a place. It's quite hard to replicate that all on teams. So, but we've had to strike a balance. So I think when I say impacting, I think the, the long-term impact it then accelerated is very much here. We've thought about it a lot from a training and development of our junior people perspective to say, okay, well, what's it like to replicate that kind of learning by osmosis that we, we probably all had. When we were juniors in the office every day, probably not even with a, work, or with a dress down day maybe at that point. Um, and to make sure that, that people still get that kind of soft learning outside of the formal learning, you know, on the way to a meeting speaking to a senior lawyer about the matter or case. How do we make sure that we've got ways that that is maintained so people aren't losing out uh, the benefit when they are working from home, which we do want to encourage. Thank you. And I'm going to put you on the spot and come to you again for this next question, because it is what has been the most influential technological development in legal tech. So I think Chris already slightly touched on this, but you are our commercial technology yeah, lawyer. So. Sure. Right. So, sure. I thought I'd get, I thought I'd get this one. Um, so, I mean, like, so legal tech has been around for a while and that has already impacted the business and practice of law. In fact, I actually sort of detect among our clients in-house legal teams that it's often accelerated their journey with legal tech quicker than even law firms sometimes, just the nature of it. 
legal ops and legal tech. I think where we are now in the middle of a wave around generative AI, and it's not the only type of AI, AI is already used in law firms around you know, uh, pattern recognition and document review. I think where we're getting to with generating content, which otherwise typically would be produced by a lawyer, we're, it, we're in an interesting nexus and fle inflection point around that. And lots of firms will be at different stages of the journey. I think for us, where we're at is we've enabled our people, I mean, we're a technology and life sciences law firm. Our clients themselves are innovative. Our clients include some of the generative AI companies. We can't not use it. We want to anyway, but it would be look ridiculous if we didn't have a plan around it. So there's sort of three stages for us, I think. So we're at the stage where we've enabled people to use the publicly available tools, ChatGPT and others are available, subject to certain principles and guardrails that encourage responsible use. So we're not going to disclose sensitive client information to the tools, but we encourage people to use them in their workflow, but to remain responsible for the output they generate. When I was a trainee, some partners would sometimes say, you can't use PLC or Lexis in your research. You've got to go to the actual source. I'm not accepting that. So, you know, you could sort of say some things don't really change. But I think people have embraced that really well. Um, you know, there are the odd a a case, we sort of laugh about it, where the tools have hallucinated some legal fact or position, which isn't true. But they've always, uh, the, our junior people or any, anyone has work that out by their own verification. So I think the responsible use of the public tools is going well. The next stage is for us is, okay, well, the, the big legal knowledge providers like LexisNexis and Westlaw all have AI integrations in their tools. We're starting to use those. The next stage is to say, you know, create something like Bristow's GPT, where it's trained and fine-tuned on our way of working, our precedent documents, our know-how, our style. So we're not there yet, but we've got a plan in place to help deliver that. That's quite a big engineering job and a legal um, professional support job as well, because to fine tune those models on any organization's data set is only as good as the quality of the data set you have. And you know, I think you know, there, there, there's different approaches within the firm to how, how complete you know, our precedent bank is that we'd like to train a tool on so that you can then spin up a chatbot to say, draft me this clause or this part of a submission that's based and founded in our approach and our information. That's the next stage for us. But the, the important thing is to communicate to clients how this works. There are some examples where we've agreed with the client, look, for this due diligence exercise or this disclosure exercise, we'll agree with the other side to use an AI tool which would short circuit some of the legal processes and to agree that there may be some risk around that, there may be things missed, and we've got to think about how clients get on board with that and also regulators, the, the SRA. You know, ultimately, we're responsible for the output we make. So again, I think every firm's at different stages in their journey here, that's where we kind of are. Uh, but I do think that it's also going to have an impact on how we train and develop junior lawyers. I, I'm an optimist around AI. I work with a lot of AI companies. I, I, do, I do think, I do like a phrase that there's out there, which is an AI won't replace your job, but a lawyer using AI might. So that's a call to action for lawyers. And actually, a bit like what we said earlier, the, the junior wave of lawyers coming through are going to be way more conversant with the technology than even we are to work with the tools and be trained and us to help train people in a way to use them responsibly that it becomes, it sort of just becomes another software tool you use, just like Word and Excel and everything else. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. I'm going to pause on the delegate questions and I'm going to come back over. Okay, so so far we have gone through law firm economics and the future of law firms, but what about the future for you all sitting here today? So the first thing that I want to talk about is how you can really distinguish where exactly you want to apply. So Chris, something that we spoke about um, in our run through was how important it is to really research firms, because something that's ar um, arisen recently are there are some trainees or associates that perhaps don't want to work for certain clients because they deem them unethical? So can you speak a bit about that and particularly how important it is to research a firm? And yeah, yeah, so um, I remember when I was looking at firms, which was you know, a little while ago now, but and when you read often the sort of marketing material that's out there, what's publicly available, um, they can all kind of sound a little bit similar within the same <laughs> sphere. Right? And, and, and all the firms that we work for on this panel, they're all full service, big law, um, firms, but actually, I think if you if you really do your research, you'll start to get under the skin of the firms, and you realise that they are all a little bit different. And some of that will be cultural, 
um, each of the firms will have a slightly different culture. Um, uh, and some of them will pay lip service to that, and some of them it will be it will be real. And, and I would I would say to you, sort of really try and understand that, understand their clients, because that's going to tell you a lot about the firm as well. Uh, like Cooley, a bit like Bristol days, we have a real focus on tech and life sciences um, uh, businesses, and and, and you know, a, a, an equally our model uh, will involve us working with those companies from like inception all the way through, and that's part of how we part of how we work and part of how we operate. For some of you, you might think. That's great. I'd love to be doing that. Others might think, actually, I'd, I'd sort of rather be working with big institutional clients the entire time, and that will have a, a, an impact on where you want to apply and the sort of firms that you might want to might want to work for. Um, and that probably goes to as well to, to your question around, um, you know, are, are you going to have a view as to certain types of client that you won't want to work with, right? Like maybe you're the sort of person who thinks I really don't want to work with oil and gas. Uh, companies, for example, or big banks and financial institutions, in which case that's going to influence um, where you want to work. Maybe you're someone who uh, really wants to be, like in my world, you might want to work on the claimant side, right? Trying to um, work with employees who, who feel they've been mistreated in some way, shape or form, and that's going to influence the sort of work that you, that you want to do. Do you have a real, a, a real focus on pro bono? Some firms, like Cooley, has a, a huge emphasis on pro bono work, and that might be something which is really important to you. So I, I would try and sh move away from just looking at face value, what firms say um, through sort of careers services, and really try and understand what it is they do. And there's so much information out there. That stuff is that's, that stuff's pretty easy to find out these days. Thank you. And obviously, one of the best ways to find out about firms is here <laughs> at Law Careers Net Live. Um, so on that, Alison, what are some good questions that delegates can be asking firms today to really get under the skin of firms and go beyond the what's written on the website? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, you'll have some questions which could be answered by the website, and that's absolutely fine. I mean, I think one of the, one of, one of the really important things to look at is how many trainees do they take and what's their retention rate like? Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be going for somewhere with, with a lower retention. You just need to go into it eyes wide open. Some of the firms will take huge numbers of trainees and, and they won't be able to keep them all on. As long as you understand that, it's fine. But, 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 but do look into that. And, and that is something you can ask um, some of the teams here. Um, culture's really hard to kind of work out. We all talk about it. It is really important. The best way to really find out about that is talk to people. Talk, I, hopefully there's lots of trainees here as well you can talk to. What's their day-to-day -day life like? What do they, you know, they get in, the mo in in the morning. What do, they, what do they do all day? Who do they talk to? What are, they, what are they entrusted to do? Are they just sitting there, you know, never speaking to a client, doing, you know, doing the same job over and over again? Or are they involved in calls, going to meet clients? Are they you know, speaking lots to other teams in the firm? Do they get the chance to kind of get involved in other initiatives, like Chris said, pro bono, recruitment, all those sorts of things? You know? And I think that's talking to trainees or newly qualified lawyers is such a, such a good way of really understanding what, what will my life be like once I'm there. Um, and then obviously there's some really, you know, at your stage, really important stuff around what is the application process actually like? You know, what do I, what do I need to do? How can I kind of bring my best features out in that process? Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Charlotte, I'm going to come to you, you next. So what are some of the biggest challenges facing trainees coming into the profession and what do they need to make themselves aware of? Um, I think I would say the AI point is the hot topic about what's going to change. And, and frankly, the, you know, the panel of partners are also new to that conversation. So I think the voices that are coming through from graduates and trainees about their experience and what they're seeing from their peers who've gone to tech or who are working in different industries using it are really valuable. So I think it's just as much an opportunity as a challenge, but it will certainly be a change. Um, I think the other one that probably feels the headlines, obviously, at the moment about the economy and political uncertainty, both domestically and on the geopolitical scale, is relevant. And I think it's good to be aware of that and the impact that it has on the marketplace of our clients and of law firms. But I would just like to be a bit of a voice of reassurance on that, because, again, I'm gonna, it's not new. You know, I, I was doing fact schemes, um, and I remember being in BCLP's office, actually, as Lehman's collapsed. And you know, the screens were filled with people flooding out banks, carrying cardboard boxes. As I was a trainee, I remember going over to Canary Wharf to take a witness statement from a bank um, and was going in through people leaving with cardboard boxes. And it was really unsettling. But it was one of those times of, 
massive shift and then change. But the legal profession is one that's almost countercyclical to uncertainty. Some departments get busier. It tends to be that transactional departments might be a bit quieter. Disputes tend to pick up a bit. And it levels out. So I would just say, again, it's not a new change. And as graduates and trainees coming through, try not to fear too much. I've seen one recession in 15 years. Partners more senior than me have seen three. It's going to be OK. It's basically. going to be OK. <laughs> and AI will help us all. <laughs> And actually, I'll just say one thing on that. I liked your comment that you said about lawyers using it. The other phrase that I've heard is there's a um, professor who specialises in law firm management. Cause, uh, he commented, when doctors talk about AI tools, they always talk about patient outcomes, diagnostic advantage, and how we can help. And I think lawyers need to have the same mindset, which is yeah. what's the value to clients. It's not about being jealously protective about our job and how we bill for it. It's what value can we give to a client by using what we now have available. No, completely. Um, I want to come on to AI a bit more. I feel like we have done quite a lot of it, but just one more thing on AI. Um, Chris, I've asked Vic, so I'm going to let you have a rest. What is AI meaning particularly for your business, especially in terms of recruitment and students applying and using AI in their applications? Yeah, um, uh, really good question. I think, like, like all of us probably on this panel, we're all at sort of that sort of inception stage. Where AI's been around for a while, right? Like, um, um, ChatGPT brought it to the fore of everyone's minds because it's now generative AI, but... AI itself has been in existence for, for, for a while. It's not, it's not a new thing. It's just that we will think about it as a sort of new thing. And, and also, it tends to be the case now that lots of companies seem to be tacking AI onto their, their company name somewhere um, along the way because they think it's the right thing to do and an easier way to raise money. Um, but look, for, for, for us, um, I don't think our recruitment processes are changing in any way this year as, as a result of kind of new new AI tools or anything like that. We have a, we have a process which is, um, and actually we were talking earlier about when we were recruiting store firms where um, probably it wasn't quite as, um, as sort of meritocratic as it is now, which is you know, based on uh, when we recruit, not looking at where, what universities people have been at, ma making sure that everything is sort of anonymized and so that everyone is really judged on their own merits and the merits of their application. So like, I don't think, frankly, there's been any real shift as a result of AI in the way that we're recruiting. What I would say to people is it's really, really obvious um, when you've like copied and pasted uh, applications from one firm to another, and like sometimes it's obvious because people have left other firm names in it. That's the, like a definite no-no because that pro probably pops you in the no pile straight away. Um, not great attention to detail, but it's also obvious if you've like not not really focused it and targeted on that particular firm. So one thing I would say to all of you is. I know it's frustrating, I know it takes a whole ton of time, but I would try and tailor each of your application forms to the firms that you are actually want to apply to. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Do, do less and do them well. Um, and I know, you know, I know it's super competitive, so you want to get as many out there, but you will, you will succeed better by really focusing on a few. Um, and yeah, do pay, spend the time, get someone else to read it as well, um, because you think you think you know what you've written. Um, but you might not, and I know people are going to put questions through through AI. Like we, we make no secret of that, but but make your answers as personal as you can because those will be the ones that stand out. Um, make sure you've changed any Americanized words as well. <laughs> My nine-year-old put his homework through AI the other day, and I was like, "You haven't written this." <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we can spot it in nine-year-old. We'll spot it in a grad as well. <laughs> Thank you, and. Um, a great place to get those application tips is obviously Law Careers Net. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a question on, we've done what are the big things worrying, so Vic, I want to come to you on, what are you actually excited about in the industry right now? What's making you happy? Right, well, I mean, um, I sit on our trainee recruitment panel and I always think, oh my gosh, I don't think I would have got a job at this firm if I'd applied now, because everyone is very good. And, and that thing about tailoring is really interesting. I think that also comes across at the interview. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, people, e e even if someone feels nervous at that interview, if you feel prepared about some talking points based on that law firm, that helps people feel more confident in the interview. And I see that come across. I think, oh, wow, they've, they've taken some time to understand us. And as you said, there's a lot more information out there about every firm than maybe when I was applying uh, to differentiate. And so I'm really excited for the new generation of lawyers coming through who are more tech first as well, have come through, you know, maybe trying to use uh, ChatGPT when they were nine years old, um, but who, who are... He won't be a lawyer, though. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, but who are actually going to help us as more, slightly more senior lawyers, kind of scary to say, um, to adapt and change and actually thinking about the outcome um, that we want to achieve uh, for clients. 
Thank you very much. And we've got a few minutes left, so I just want to finish on all of your top tips for delegates today in general life on how they're going to succeed. <laughs> Probably not their personal lives and dating, but how they can succeed in law. Yeah, <laughs> yeah when we're at the stands. <laughs> Alison, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think just be, like, be your true self. Uh, I think, you know, you can put all this time, you get all this help with your application form. When you're sitting in an interview, it's you and it's you alone. And so the more authentic you can be, the easier your life will be, but the easier it is for us to understand you. And that's also why the vacation schemes are so great, because for us, we get to see you, but you get to see the firm warts and all as well. And I think, um, and people, be, people as well being their authentic self. I mean, everyone on a kind of day like this is, is in like interview mode, including the people you will meet out there. Um, but over a two week vacation scheme, you can't be like that. Just relax. It's okay. You know, I think, yeah, just, just, yeah, be as true to yourself as you can. Thank you. And Chris? Um, I'm actually going to sort of continue from where Vic left off like, about something that excites me and something I think is also going to be really good for all of you, which is that I think um, over the time I've been doing um, this, there's been a shift towards lawyers becoming business advisors as well. And it's actually, it's quite an American thing, actually. In, in the US, lawyers, people don't talk about instructing a lawyer in the US in the same way as they do. In, people talk about instructing a solicitor in the UK, which kind of sounds a bit like client tells me what to do and I do it regardless of whether or not it's the right thing to do. And in the States, um, lawyers are very much seen as like business advisors, right? They sit in board meetings. They are really close with their clients. I think there is a shift now in the UK market to lawyers becoming like business advisors. What that requires is, and this is what sort of excites me as well, but I think is also a really good point for all of you to think about, is for you to have general business and like commercial acumen as well. So it's no longer good enough to be able to say, you've asked me a question, here's the law on that, you know, copied and pasted from PLC. Um, like they, they don't want that anymore. They want to make sure that you really understand the context in which they operate, what their peers are doing, um, like the, the factors that might be impacting their business. And no one is expecting you to have that from day one, right? Of course not. But to the extent you can start to show, even through interviews and things on these vacation schemes, that you've got a bit of a sense of that, of how to be commercial and how to be able to advise clients within a commercial context, that is going to make you st like stand out, I think, from, from some others who, who sort of might not have thought so much about that. So I think it's, it's also a really exciting thing for you coming into the profession now because that is going to be the way that all clients want to be advised and, and sort of one example of that I, I often feel like now when I'm advising clients if they have to scroll um, they're probably not reading it right so it's kind of got to fit in that that one that one pane and that is a that's a challenge for and also they don't want to see statute names in there so you have to know the law and be able to convey it to clients within a commercial context so no one's expecting you to have that but that would be my that would be my top tip thank you charlotte uh mine would be to invest in your network and we've talked about the value of people and it's the culture of the people that you join a firm with, but also in terms of where work comes from, it's people that make that decision. Um, a lot of our work comes from referrals from other lawyers who might be conflicted against working adverse to the banks, for example. And the people that you sit in your lectures or at conferences with or do vacation schemes or training contracts with, they move and they might end up being at other firms that have opportunity to refer work to you. Uh, they might end up at clients, but also they give you a breadth of experience across the market in terms of actually understanding how your culture that you're experiencing compares to someone else. So don't underestimate, I would say, the value of staying in touch with people um, and including the supervisors that you work with, clients, network and people are what have directed the changes I've made in my career. It's conversations and the people you know, as opposed to just the techie part of the law that you're doing. I think that is really formative. Thank you very much. And if anyone is suddenly lost for questions, we've actually got networking cards set out on tables to help you. So go and have a look at those for ideas of what to talk about. And finally, Vic. Yeah, thanks. So I would just build on what Chris said, actually, about ha <laughs> thinking about how in a kind of slightly m m m the merging world and the wave of AI that we've talked a lot about today is coming, how you have an edge and can add value. And again, no one's expecting that from day one for trainees. But what we can expect is there's so much material out there about the sector that you're working in, the client sector that you're working in. And you can, it is within people's gift to learn as much as they can about that market, the trends, what's happening. So for example, in the tech sector, with AI, when we advise clients, 
we can connect, we, if we have a really close eye on what's happening in industry, we can connect that to how we advise them on legal issues. So we, d we end up being more valuable to them to say, well, actually, if you adopted an AI model in this way or licensed it in that way or use this sort of data set, that would be a more compliant legally way to do it. So I think we can encourage people at a junior level to say, okay, well, just knowing the, what the statutes and the case law says and, and kind of being able to repeat that to a client, well, that's going to become automated. The edge is going to come from really knowing about the particular sector you happen to be in at that moment or where you qualify into and then connecting what's going on, your nose on it, or to the grind of what's going on in that market, to then connect that back to how you then advise clients so that you're then building advice on top of whatever AI tool has been able to produce. And I think that will become where lawyers retain their edge and stay relevant. Thank you very much. Right, Alison, Chris, Charlotte and Vic, I want to thank you so much for being on the panel today. I'm going to hand back over to Beth.